Good morning, everybody. Happy Father's Day to all the dads. Special word of welcome to anybody that's new with us at any of our campuses at the Ascent. Uh, and everybody that's going to be joining us, uh, watching the video at any point in time, are you ready for some good news? God is not a slave master who is driving his slaves to be obedient out of a sense of his own selfish desires. No, God is a father who has a beautiful vision for your life, a vision that is more far-reaching and beautiful than what you could dream up for yourself. And like any good father, he wants to impart that vision to you so that then the rest of your life can align with it. We're in a study of the Proverbs. We call it foolproof because it's all about receiving the wisdom of Christ that erases the folly of our lives. And we come today to Proverbs 29, verse 18, just this one verse that is one of the best known, best love of Proverbs and perhaps least understood. It is Proverbs 29, verse 18, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. Some translations, uh, like the old King James says, the people perish, where there's no vision, the people perish. The word could mean uh, they are going into anarchy. It could mean simply they are discouraged. Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. I don't really know how I stumbled upon it. I just was thinking, have I ever preached on this text before? And I couldn't remember, and I opened up some old files, and lo and behold, I preached on this text in October of 1998. And what was interesting to me about that was as I opened up, I had a manuscript of that message, and the message fell two weeks after our daughter Abigail was born. She was born on the 29th of September, a Tuesday in 1998. And I don't know if this was the first or second time that I would have been back in the pulpit after her birth and preached the message. And I read the introduction and it made me laugh out loud because I was curious what would have been on my mind in proclaiming the gospel as I introduced the sermon, perhaps the first sermon that I preached after our precious daughter had been born. And this is what was in the introduction to that sermon 19 years ago. I'm reading from the manuscript of the sermon. I have acquired an application for permission to date my daughter. <laughs> the applicant must fill it out before taking Abigail on a date. I'm reading from a sermon 19 years old. Of course, she will be 21 years of age before she has a first date. You can't be prepared too early. And the form begins with basic information, name, height, weight, IQ, GPA, Anticipated graduate study program to be pursued after college. Hours spent in prayer and Bible study daily. Just, you know, general information like that. That is then followed by a simple yes or no section. The yes or no section on the form, the application to date my daughter, has some of these questions. Do you own a van? Yes or no. Do you own a truck with oversized tires? Yes or no. Do you own a waterbed? Yes or no. Do you have a nose ring, belly button ring, or any other ring attached to something it should not be attached to? If any of the above answers is yes, then discontinue the application and immediately leave the premises. The next section on the application, so my sermon from 19 years ago said, the next section of the application to date my daughter is a narrative section with these instructions in 50 words or less. What does do not touch my daughter mean to you? <laughs> And there are a few other questions on the form, like, what would be the best time to interview your father, mother, and pastor? And at the end of the form, 
the applicant signs and has the document notarized with the statement, to the best of my knowledge, under penalty of death, dismemberment, electrocution, Chinese water torture, and or a red hot poker, all statements included herein are true. And it concludes finally by saying, thank you for your interest. Please allow four to six years for processing. <laughs> <laughs> so this was what was on my mind in my first sermon or so after Abigail had been born. And the sermon continued like this. These are the exact words from that manuscript. It said, the sermon that I preached two weeks after Abigail's birth, uh, I have a vision for my daughter's life. And it's not for her to date certain kinds of men. <laughs> a parent loves a child and begins to have a picture over the child's life. Envisions how it will be for her. For Abigail, I envision her to be, as the Bible describes, her namesake, Abigail, a beautiful and wise woman. I want her to be beautiful inwardly, full of the joy, peace, gentleness, and vitality of the Holy Spirit. I want her to grow in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with men. I want her to love God with all of her heart, to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, and because I have a vision of purity over her life, it means some things don't fit my vision. Of course, there are pieces of this picture. I really don't know how they will actually be lived out. I don't know what color her hair, her eyes are going to be. There will be plenty of surprises in her personality along the way, things I would never have guessed. And I believe that she'll accomplish things that I currently am not able to imagine that she'll accomplish. Those are my words 19 years ago. And so here I am on a Father's Day, 19 years later, and thankfully we're still two years away from anyone's uh, right to fill out the application to date her yet, so that's still in place. <laughs> and, uh, but as I first held her and envisioned some things about her life, I see that she has grown in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and with men, that she is, as her mother and I dreamed, a wise and beautiful woman. There's so much that I didn't know, I couldn't have known. I uh, didn't know that in the early part of her life that Abigail would not live in a light-hearted home. For just a few months afterwards uh, was when we would uh, battle against and pray and grieve the advanced cancer that eventually took Abigail's Aunt Mary away from the earth. And I didn't know that as a one-year-old that Abby would breathe in some of the weightiness of living in a household that had a lot of grief. I didn't know we'd have to pray that God would do a miracle and remove the thread of melancholy that had infiltrated her tiny soul. And that we would have to ask God to make her into a joyful child because our earliest pictures we have of her, she's not smiling. I would never have been able to know how much God would answer that prayer and turn my baby girl into a girl of laughter and silliness. And I just never would have known that um, she would be an odd mixture of a girl that loved to wear frilly dresses, so girly. And she loved to climb trees and go on adventures. I didn't know how much she loved dogs and all animals and how much she would crave riding a horse and beg me every chance she could to get her a horse and yet also enjoy dancing classical ballet. I didn't know that as a little girl, her mind would develop this quick snarky wit so that when I once said to her, I think I'm getting too fat, and she spontaneously said back, Dad, you don't look fat with a shirt on. I didn't know she'd be that kind of a wit. I didn't know that she would shun math and science but win national speech contests, and I didn't know that one day I would sit in the Dean Dome and watch her school play basketball. So many facets to the wonder and beauty of Abigail Wright that I could never have known but the lovely pure woman of God who she is does not surprise me and did not happen by accident it was the result of a vision that first lived in her parents hearts we had the vision for her life first and the most important thing that could ever happen in a child's life is to get a vision from God 
that may come through godly parents, but is about who she's destined to be. To get a vision of living as a child of God, to get a vision of an identity that is filled with value and purpose. And the spirit of this age is quick to accuse me as I make that statement to say, oh, that you're trying to control your child and exert undue influence. Just let the child become who the child is going to become. Whatever she wants to become, let them find their own direction. Don't try to tell them anything about who they are or what their destiny is. That's the cry of this age, isn't it? And indeed, there have been parents and authorities who have issued dictatorial, shame-filled, controlling types of messages that have been rooted in personal self-interest. And that sort of shaming and that sort of controlling behavior our society has so vigorously rejected that now the spirit of the age says offer no vision for the child at all. And not only is such a belief absolutely wrong, but it is nonsensical if you think about it. Because how foolish it would be to raise a child with no vision for the next steps of the child. Why, when a child is crawling, the parents have a vision of the child being able to walk. That's why we take their little hands and we hold them and we straddle them as we show them the feeling of what it would be like to take one step after the other. What are we doing? We're giving them a vision of walking. It's why we, we buy them books and sit them in our laps and read to our preschoolers because we have a vision of them being able to read. You see, the parent's always casting a vision. And that vision, when it becomes one that is rooted in the scriptures and rooted in, in God's prophetic inspiration that flows, then that vision has a great power to it. We're not, we're not talking about raising slaves or robots who merely perform obediently for us. No, instead what we're doing is we are trying to implant a vision that that vision takes hold inside of the child's heart and then the child lets everything else align to that vision. So to say that where there's no vision or revelation, people cast off restraint is to say, if you don't have a God-given vision for your life, then there is no inward ruling force that shapes all your decisions and behaviors. So all of life becomes hit or miss. It becomes here or there. A life with no particular alignments is just whatever seems right at the moment. But you are made for so much more than that. And God is not silent and God is not in hiding, but he's given a revelation of himself in his word and he has promised that anyone who receives Christ is given the precious gift of the Holy Spirit. So you have the very spirit of Jesus, Christian, that lives within you. And God's not trying to hide the plan for your life. He's not trying to hide himself from you, but he's revealing himself. And he's a leader, he's a shepherd, he's a guide. And, and he wants you to have a prophetic vision of your life. It doesn't mean that you need to have an oracle that comes and says to you, here's a blueprint for your life. It says the foretelling of God's mind and about who you are and what your identity is. It is so interesting in this proverb because it says, Whoever, wherever there's no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. And you would think that the next statement, the parallel statement, like happens in so many of these couplets in the Proverbs, might come like this. Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But where there is revelation, the people flourish. You might expect something like that. But instead what follows is, but blessed is he who keeps the law. And at first glance, it seems like, well, what is the relationship between keeping the law and, and the prophetic vision? And I want to show you today that, that that connection is everything. That though at first glance it seems to be disconnected, that it is the connection that matters the most. Because obedience, and by that we mean your behaviors and attitudes in your life are coming from somewhere. You understand that your behaviors are coming from some understanding, some belief. And what happens when there's a vision from God that gets into your life, then that vision is instructing all your behaviors, thus obedience in your life. So I want to show you in this magnificent proverb today, I want to show you this, this inseparable, powerful connection between the power of vision from God and the delight of obedience in the very best, truest sense of the grace-filled notion of that word and what that means and why it is such very, very good news for us. Let me start with this. 
how sad and empty and dangerous it is where there is no vision. If there is no revelation, there's no way forward. Or if there is a way forward, it is fraught with danger. While the spirit of the age says to us that you are more free if there's no one telling you anything to do, biblical faith is exactly the opposite. In fact, all throughout the scriptures, wherever there is a famine of the word of God, there is grief in the hearts of the people of God. Proverbs 11:14 says, where there is no guidance, a people falls, but in abundance of counselors, there's safety. In 1 Samuel 3, 1, we read, Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. There is grief about that. Amos 8 has one of the most sobering prophecies of judgment. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread nor of thirst for water, but of hearing of the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro and seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. And when they were in exile in Babylon, part of their great lament and lamentations too was the lack of, of the vision of God. Her gates have sunk into the ground, Lamentations 2.9. He has ruined and broken her bars. Her kings and princes are among the nations. The law is no more and her prophets find no vision from the Lord. Hosea 4, 6 said it just plainly, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. What I'm saying is that in the scriptures, there is abject grief if there is no instruction from the transcendent God. How this flies in the face of the very spirit of the age that says you are going to be more free if you have no instruction coming down upon your life. But the people of God understood it, that what we need, and we need it so deeply, is we need a vision if we're going to be able to move forward. And we need a vision from God if we're going to be able to move forward in a way that causes us to flourish rather than wreck our lives. You have to have it. I, I bring a, a fresh example of this, r- raw more than fresh. So according to... Our usual uh, custom, we gathered as a family at Ocean Isle Beach this year, Anne's family there. Not all the cousins could come this year, but still we're there. There are 10 of us, and we decided to step out of the norm and try a new restaurant, Risky. Uh, but my wife and I had seen a sign for Snooky's Waterfront Dining in Little River, South Carolina, Snookies, it's got to be good if it's called Snookies. And there's one little single lane road that goes down to Snookies. We drove down to see what it looked like, and it was beautiful. It's down on, on, the, on an inlet of the waterway and a little marina. It's just beautiful. It has outdoor covered seating, and, and we said, why don't we try it? And so we made our plan. They don't take reservations, but I wisely decided at 6.30 to call and see what the wait was. It was less than 10 minutes. I also wisely checked my weather app on the phone to make sure no storm was going to hit us because most of the seating is outdoor seating, and there were storms to the south and the west, but the weather app said they weren't going to come upon Little River. We're safe. We went but you know how it takes a long time to get moving, so we didn't leave at 6.30. We didn't get gone until 7.15, arrived there at 7.35, and the wait had grown to 40 minutes. But the other thing that had changed was also the weather forecast. There were black clouds, and they were moving towards us. And they were moving towards us fast. We had taken a little walk on the docks of the marina looking at the beautiful yachts. And I said, I think we better get up there under the cover. And so we went up there and we sat down uh, uh, on some little benches up under the cover. And then the rain started coming and the rain was blowing in sideways. And so we started huddling under the covered area there behind the poor patrons that were eating their nice meals and were over their shoulders. And the lightning started and the sky was just filled with electricity and it was thundering 
hovering right on top of us. It was so bad that I, I got my crew. I said, let's get inside and just stood around there at the cash register area, just waiting, hoping to get a table. And after about 35 minutes of waiting in the midst of one of the worst electrical storms I'd ever been in, it was clear that finally some people were clearing out and we were going to have some tables. And right about the time they were getting ready to seat us, there was a loud clap of thunder and a flash of light at the exact same instant it hit us. It hit somewhere right atop of the building. Its electricity came in. The lights of the place went zap and out it went. It was totally dark in the restaurant and there was a groan in the restaurant. And we were groaning more than the rest of them since we've been waiting 40 minutes. The other people at least had food on the table. And then all of a sudden the lights came back on and we were like, hurrah! And we were celebrating. Great. Okay, we waited a long time. It's a terrible storm, but we're going to be seated. And then the manager walked over to us and he said, I have bad news. He said, the lightning has knocked out my ventilation system. I have to close the kitchen. I can't cook food. I can't ventilate anything. There will be no more cooking food tonight. So now we've been there 45 minutes, and the lightning is crackling outside as bad as I can ever remember. And we looked on the weather apps, and the lightning strikes, it shows where they are. And it said they were 0.0 miles away, which meant they were on top of us. And one of the downsides of Snookies is there are only six parking places that are close. The rest of them are 100 yards away. We were in the ones 100 yards away. It was just too unsafe for me and my brother-in-law to go get our cars and bring them up close so that we could get everybody loaded up into our cars we had to just sit there and said wait for it to pass it did not pass quickly we were there for at least an hour and 15 minutes with no food you'd have thought they'd have brought us some crackers or something but we just sat there and watched the other people eat and watched the lightning and waited until fine so now it has finally grown to be 9 30 at night and we have not eaten any food Thankfully, my nephew, Zach, who's on the autism spectrum, is having a stellar night, and God's grace is sustaining him throughout all of this, but he's hungry, he wants food, and we know what he feels like. And finally, watching the app, also all I did for an hour and 15 minutes, look at the weather, and it finally came up and said, the lightning strikes are now 0.4 miles away. I said, this is our opportunity. We ran down through the storm and the trudging through the water in the face and on the shoes splashing, got into the car got in such a hurry I slammed the door on my own left hand but it was all right we got back and we picked everybody up safely we got in the cars and we said we're going to order some Domino's pizza and we're pulling out the single road that leads out this one little one lane road that leads out and I started pulling through this little intersection where there's a dip in the road and I noticed there was a lot of standing water right there And I started to pull through it slowly, and I looked up, and the car who had been pulling out in front of us had stalled out in the midst of it. And I realized it was a flood. It was a flash flood. And I called the restaurant, and I said, is there any other way out of here? They said, no, that's the only road. And so now I backed up, and we sat there, having been at Snooky's for two hours with no food, and now there was a flood in the road, and we could not move. And so we didn't know what to do. Sitting there. And I said to everyone, it's raining really hard. And so I don't think flash flooded areas get better when it's still raining. And we were stuck. I give you my picture of Snookies. I don't know if the food's good or bad. I do want to try it sometime. To say that there we sit with no information about how we can get out. And that is a picture of a life without any vision. If we move forward, it's uncertain. It just feels dangerous and foolish. But if we just sit there, we're going nowhere. Finally, my niece Anna Catherine got out of the car and her bare feet and started walking around saying she was going to try to find an answer. She tested out the water, realized it was knee deep. It was too deep to travel through. And she wandered off to the side in a little side parking lot. And a while later, she came back. I would, of course, gotten out and, 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 and bravely faced the elements, but I had long pants on. I couldn't do it. So Anna Catherine did it for us. And (laughs) she came back. She said, I think I found a way. 
She said, if we turn right in this parking lot right here, there's a concrete barrier down there right as it comes up to the marina, but you can turn left up into a grassy area and get up onto a flat grassy area that you can travel on, and it'll take us out back to the road just beyond where the flood is. And, and, and she was convincing. And so we said, well, that's a revelation. And we did it, and we drove out, and we went and got our Domino's pizza. How ridiculous it would be if we found a way out of the flood, out of the storm, and to Domino's Pizza, how ridiculous it would be to say, well, nobody's going to tell me what to do, and uh, I'm just going to drive through this flood. See, that's nonsensical. The vision, the revelation is simply this. It is the unveiling of something you could not previously see. See, we do not know God except God in his sovereign grace has unveiled himself to us. When you open up a present that's wrapped in a beautiful wrapping, you unwrap it. You don't create the present that's in there. You just unveil it. See, that's what revelation is. And that's what Proverbs 29, 18 is talking about, is the prophetic revelation or vision is the unveiling or the foretelling of God's own heart and his mind towards us. And God has a vision and a plan in your life, and it's a beautiful one. And what it means for you is not just safe travel out of the storm, but what it means to you is to energize you and excel, to excel in the very thing God's called you to. See, a prophetic revelation, an unveiling of God's, God's glorious grace to you and who he is and what he has for you is not going to create within you some laziness that says, well, God's just going to bless me anyway, and so I just won't do anything. That's not the way it works. I've used this illustration before, but I can't think of a better one. Olympic gold medalist Julia Mancuso won the giant slalom at the 2006 Winter Olympics. She also was silver medalist in both the downhill and the combined in 2010 and the bronze medalist in the combined in 2014. And what was so interesting is that when she was a little girl, she drew a crayon rendering of herself winning a gold medal skiing down a hill little stick figure little girl skiing down a hill winning a gold medal and put it up on her wall now she was convinced what is that she had a vision of herself as a gold medalist now once she saw it clearly a vision of herself as a gold medalist what did that do to her did it cause her to just say well I'm going to be a gold medalist so I'm just going to sit on the couch and eat chips until somebody brings me my medal of course not. What it did for her was it brought an energy into her life where she trained and she trained and she lifted weight and she skied every day of her life. That's what vision does. A vision from God about wonderful things in your future doesn't make you complacent. It makes you energized. You could say that Julia Mancuso was energized by the vision and thus became gladly obedient to the vision. Do you see it? This is the connection. Blessed is she who obeys the law. He's not referencing arbitrary laws of drudgery. He's saying when God reveals a vision, your whole being begins to line up to it. it brings into your life an energy. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and young men shall fall exhausted. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And they shall mount up with wings like eagles and run and not be weary and walk and not faint. Habakkuk prophesied, the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Have you ever had to do some work and you had no vision for it whatsoever? I remember distinctly the first time this happened in my life. I was working as a teenager 
for the summer in a program that had been offered by the Greensboro Parks and Recreation Service. And I was stationed at the Spencer Love Tennis Courts as part of the J.C. Park in Greensboro. There were too many of us. We were city employees for the summer, and there was not enough for us to do. Uh, there was only so much that was needed by sweeping the composition courts and taking care of them. They didn't entrust to us working the cash registers or checking in the people come to play tennis or even taking the reservation. We were there more for grunt work. And I remember one day in particular, there were four of us and there was just nothing much to do. There was a big project coming and we were going to get real busy with it. And that was, we were going to help resurface the composition courts, this green sandy like stuff that goes on the soft courts. And, but this day we didn't have all the materials. It wasn't yet time for the resurfacing effort and so our supervisor came to us and said boys he said what we're going to do today is you see this big green pile of composition it's just like green sand sort of he said I need you to move it from here to here it was about 20 feet away and I knew what was going to happen is that once we resurface the courts we're going to be moving this stuff spreading it on the courts he just gave us busy work to move a pile of sand 20 feet with shovels and wheelbarrows. And we did it all day long. It is very hard to get motivated to meaninglessly move a pile of green sand. It's drudgery. Compare that to my time at the beach where we had another regular custom and that is to build sand sculptures we um, build big sand sculptures that require big mounts of sand the very good looking guy with the straw hat there in the striped pants is me and um, I did some of the digging but we now have strong grown nephews to do uh, so much of the digging and we build these big pyramids and um, and, it, and people come down the beach and they marvel at our creations. You couldn't get me to dig for free at home. But at the beach, we got a vision of building a big sand pyramid. And where we learned this from was about 15 years ago, walking down the beach and saw another man who had built something similar. And he explained how he did it. And he showed us the tools that he used, the, the masonry trowels to make it flat and how important it is to get the angles right at the top. And now it helps that we have strong young nephews to do digging and one of them is a structural engineer and that helps as well. The difference between moving a pile of sand versus getting a vision of something that you can build and then applying yourself to it. It is partly to say that where there's a vision from God, it brings focus into your life professional golfer Jason Day has not had a good U.S. Open this year, but he has had some time as the number one player in the world. And Jason Day does an interesting thing before he hits a golf shot. He looks out into the fairway, standing behind the ball, and then for a, a, what seems to be a long few moments, he closes his eyes. He just leaves them closed. And he's described that what he's doing is that once he's looked down the fairway, he closes his eyes and he envisions his shot. He envisions the flight of the golf ball, how high it will travel, the curvature of the shot, whether it's a draw to the left or a, a, a fade back to the right. He envisions where the ball will land in the fairway. Why is he doing that? Because what he's wanting to have happen is he wants focus from his entire body. And every bit of it to be focused around this one specific vision. It means every sinew, every nerve ending, every movement must align with the vision of what's coming next. And because that vision is clear in his mind, it means that his legs aren't going to walk to the side, find a flower, and look at a butterfly. Now that might be a wonderful thing to do at some other occasion. But right now the vision is this golf shot. Do you see the power of focus? When you have vision, it restrains you from other choices. If you don't have vision, you cast off restraint and you do just anything. Focus is a very powerful thing. You can turn on a light bulb in a room and 
the diffuse light will illumine the room, and that's powerful. But if you focus the light enough, it becomes a laser beam that could cut through metal. There are many reasonable choices at any moment of your life. But what really matters is the vision of God. In Michael Hyatt's book, Your Best Year Ever, I was taken by this comment that he said, efficiency is not simply becoming more productive in doing more things. Efficiency is doing the right things, the things that matter. And here's what's such good news for us. The vision of God is not off in the distance, unattainable, but it's at hand. One of the most important verses and one of my favorite in all the scripture, the 12th chapter of Hebrews, the first verse, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How are we going to do that? Verse 2, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. For us in the new covenant, prophetic vision is a vision of the crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ. That what happens is when you set your sights upon him, it is there in the vision of Jesus that you're energized to run the race. It is there where you cast all the sin to the side, casting all your burdens to the side because of the resolute focus of seeing Jesus and what he's done for you. And what I'm saying is that the gospel is a message of hope. It is a message of the goodness of God towards you. It is a message of God's plan and his wonder-working grace that is available to you. And when you see Jesus, it changes everything. When Zacchaeus saw Jesus and Jesus said, I want to spend the day with you, this despised tax collector who had been a thief, he spontaneously, without Jesus saying a word to him, he said, Lord, I'm going to give half my goods to the poor, and if I've ever defrauded anybody, I'm going to make it up to them fourfold. This is the... This is the nature of what happens to you. Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus, was on his way on the Damascus road to persecute Christians. When a blinding light came from heaven and a voice spoke to him and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And this Saul of Tarsus had a vision of Jesus and he moved from being the chief persecutor to the chief preacher. And sometime look it up later in Acts chapter 26, I think it is, where he is testifying to King Agrippa and he gives his testimony of what happened to him on Damascus Road. And even though Paul's life is on the line, even though Paul has been in prison and no telling what's going to happen to him, he gives his testimony and he just says, this is what happened to me and I saw Jesus. And then he says this amazing line, he said, and I have not been disobedient to the vision. Do you see what he's saying? There is an inseparable connection between your behaviors and attitudes and the vision that you have from God. And when you have a vision that comes from God, when you see Jesus, it changes everything in your life. So obedience is the glad, delightful following of the very instruction of God that has come to you as this enormous and wonderful gift which leaves us with several practical pieces of good news to take away from this today first the focus of your life is not obey 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 and then God will be pleased with you instead the focus of your life is in Jesus Christ God is pleased with you and therefore he gives you vision 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 and following that you may obey secondly you're no longer under an old covenant in which the prophets would speak from time to time and sometimes there would be a famine of the word of the Lord when they were disobedient. But you have come into a new covenant and when you're in Christ you have the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth who Jesus said would lead you into all truth. He is always pointing you to Jesus. And thirdly it means for us in a very practical way you can help others by the power of blessing 
You don't control others or try to bind their consciences, and we never do that. But what we do as the people of God is we speak forth the good news of the gospel and we gain prophetically an image of a positive future over one another's lives and we bless our kids and we bless one another and we can even bless our enemies. Wow. Well, Abby is not aware of until she hears this sermon that I have an application to date my daughter form. We haven't discussed it at all. And, uh, but actually, I don't think that I need the form anymore because I noticed she was paying careful attention to the recent royal wedding. And she looked at me and she said, Dad, you know, marrying a prince is still not off the table for me. <laughs> Her view of her life has now expanded maybe even beyond of what I had had for her life. Wherever people don't have a vision for their life from God, they'll just do anything. Spend their time with anybody. Cast off restraint. But where there's vision, there's a blessing. Blessed is he or she who obeys the vision of God and that's the gospel.